art and attitude of the person are in the right place. It's also important to know that worship is reserved only for God. We are not to worship saints, prophets, statues, angels, any false gods, or Mary, the mother of Jesus. We also should not be worshiping with the expectation of something in return. Worship is done for God because he deserves it and for his pleasure alone. True worship is felt inwardly and then is expressed through our actions. Worshiping out of obligation is displeasing to God and completely in vain. He can see through all the hypocrisy and he hates it. A related example is the story of Cain and Abel. They both brought gift offerings to the Lord, but God was only pleased with Abel's. Cain brought the gift out of obligation. Abel, he brought out of faith and admiration for God. True worship is not confined to what we do in church or open praise, although these things are both good and we are told in the Bible to do them. True worship is the acknowledgement of God and all His power and glory in everything we do. The highest form of praise and worship is obedience to Him and His work. To do this, we must know God. We cannot be ignorant of Him. Worship is to glorify and exalt God, to show our loyalty and admiration to our Father. That answers the question, what is true worship? Research this question further on our website, GodQuestions.org. Give a thumbs up and be sure to click subscribe. Meanwhile, check out these other questions. And I would encourage you to check it out. They've got a lot of, a lot of good resources on their uh, site there. Well, we are continuing our series on The Church Has Left the Building. Today we're in part five, and we're looking at the work of the church, the work of the church. But as a quick review, as we always do, uh, we know that the church is those who have trusted by faith, faith alone, in Christ alone for salvation. Not by works, not baptism or anything like that, but only by faith. We also remember that the church is an organized organism for family. And of course, we are structured around the ancient synagogue model. And we also have learned that God has ordained two offices or two leadership positions within the church, pastor and deacon. And at times, deaconesses too. Though God has given the main leadership roles to men. We talked about that last time too. We also looked at the qualifications and the responsibilities within each of these positions. And talked about a few questions that do arise when it comes to leadership. Today we're talking about the work of the church. Now what do I mean by that? These are the things that we do for in-reach and outreach, basically. Uh, when we gather and when we scatter. While there are many things, of course, that we could discuss, I'm only going to be focusing on five of them. Five of them. Preaching, teaching, evangelism, providing for needs, and worship. So we talked a little bit about worship and why you saw the video there. Now, some of this is going to be a bit of a review. Uh, some of it is going to be new. Uh, but I'm going to be giving a general overview and try and make some application for us. Uh, in this series here. Uh, I'll went over some of this in the five E's of the church some time ago, and you can go back and listen to that and, and look at all that uh, whenever you get a chance to. So we're going to be reading from Acts 2, so if you're able to stand, we're going to be reading quite a few verses, so if you need to sit down, that's quite all right. I understand that too. But if you would please, if you can, please stand. We're going to read Acts 2, 29 through 47. And this is in the middle of Peter's sermon, by the way, at Pentecost. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day, being therefore a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, that's a Davidic covenant, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of this Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know, for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus, whom you crucified. Now when they had heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? 
And Peter said to them, Repent. Be baptized every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, or in light of the forgiveness of your sins, that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized. And there were added to that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and, and dis distributing the proceeds to all, as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day, those who are being saved. Let's pray. Again, our God and Father, we thank you for your word. We pray now, Lord, that you would teach us and speak to us through your word. Show us who we need to be as the body of Christ. May you fill us with your spirit, open our eyes, help us to focus on you, to be attentive to what you say for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Well, as we uh, look at this text, there's a lot of things in this text, but uh, there's a variety of topics that we could discuss. But the first one I want us to consider is preaching. Preaching. Verses 29 through 41. Preaching. And uh, we see this is what Peter is actually doing here at Pentecost, at the temple during this time. And I want to include two aspects to this. Preaching outside of the church and preaching inside the church. Now, first, I want us to remember the historical context. This was Passover, one of the main feasts where all the males were required to come to Jerusalem. And, of course, their families would come along, too, with them. So by this time, there was probably a good one million people or so in Jerusalem. And it's not a huge megacity. This was a lot of people for a small town. And uh, it's, it was pretty crowded, I'm sure. And uh, Peter, he was preaching at Pentecost. And... He quotes a variety of Old Testament texts, you know, prophecies and things like that, and proclaims Christ to the people in public. Because remember, they, you know, they knew about Jesus, they had heard about his miracles, they heard about this, they knew he was crucified, they, they recognized that we're a part of that, and now Peter's calling them to task. He's calling them to repentance. He's saying, Christ has come, and... He was crucified by you. Now we know that everyone is guilty of that, of course, too. But Peter, as a Jew, is pointing to his own people as the ones who instigated that. And their response, of course, is, well, what do we do? And he tells them. And 3,000, think of this. People usually, and I've heard this said at like evangelistic crusades, 3,000 people got saved! That's wonderful, but Wait a second, let's take a step back for a moment. 3,000 out of probably a million people that were there at this time. Now, we don't know how many people were there around the temple that heard Peter. Probably a lot more. But we see that there's results of preaching, and they are going to vary. They are going to vary. But here's a question What is preaching? Simply put, it is the proclamation of the truth. Now you look in books and stuff and preaching books and this book and that book and online, you'll see all sorts of definitions and of course good definitions. But I think the simplest one is this, proclamation of the truth. Proclaiming the truth. And in this text, it was at Herod's temple. And as I said, two contexts. And the first here is outside of the assembly, outside of a gathering. Could call it evangelism, which we'll talk about in a minute. But basically, we proclaim Jesus to the world that does not know him and is hostile to him. And that salvation is only available in him. And we 
do this publicly. Now, one example is when I was in China a few years ago. Um, it was at nighttime. I uh, gone with a missionary group there uh, from the church I was attending at the time. And uh, another guy was with me. We were out night. I was taking pictures and looking around and everything. And this little girl came up to us. She was probably about nine, ten years old, maybe. And she started speaking English. Pretty good English, too. We were like, oh, wow, hi. And, of course, in that environment, you know, the people want to practice their English. They want to talk to you. You know, so we're you know, glad to talk to her. So while we're talking to her, there's people that just started kind of coming around. You know, these guys and stuff. And, and there was a guard, by the way, too, because we were by a, a Mao statue, and we were taking some pictures of that. And he was, the guard was walking around, too. So what did we do? Well, we started sharing Christ with these guys. Some could speak a little bit of English. But to our surprise, this young girl translated for us to share the gospel with this group of men who was around this Mao Zedong statue in communist China. It was wonderful. We had a, probably a good 12, 15 people around us. Uh, you know, my friend Matt, he had one group, I had another group, and this little girl was just translating away. It, was, it truly was something that the Lord orchestrated. And it was great. It was great. That's kind of a public proclamation. And some of you may have heard the uh, term street preaching. I hope you guys have ever heard that term. Yeah, I haven't seen many recently. And unfortunately, I think that uh, in our culture, street preaching is not done as much as it used to be. Now, some do it. You know, over in California, you know, the Red Comfort does it with Living Waters, and some others do it too. Uh, but it is still done in parts of the world today. And it is effective. If you do it the right way. I remember when I was in college, and there was a... I guess you say an evangelist out, you know, street preacher, and he was pretty much making a fool of himself on the campus of the school, and uh, it was pretty sad, you know. But I, I was not who I should have been at that time too. But I, I remember the way he portrayed himself, and it was not a good, not a, a wise way to do that. But here we have public preaching. Now you think, well, I'm not a public preacher. That's okay. You can still proclaim Christ in the world. Wherever you are, however you do it. And we'll talk a little bit more about evangelism here in just a minute. But the second part is within the church. Preaching within. Proclamation of the truth within the church. We hear some pastors are called preachers. Well, why is that? Well, they declare the word of God. And that's what we do. But sometimes we think of preachers as, you know, loud and sweaty and, you know, they're spitting all over the place while they're talking. You know, their face is red using illustrations, and that may be the case, but they're not all like that. Not all like that. So there's a different ways that preaching and proclamation can be done, but at the core, the preacher is to boldly proclaim the Word of God. And while there is a special gift of that, this is something we should all be doing. We should all be boldly proclaiming the Word of God. And within the body of Christ, within the church, this is to challenge people to follow what God says. Do what he says, or the results will not be good. It's a challenge, and there is definitely a need for that today. But connected to preaching, we see in verse 42 of Acts 2, is teaching. This is a second work of the church, a second responsibility, you could say. I say, well, what is teaching? It's the explanation of the truth. So preaching is declaring the truth. Teaching is explaining the truth. Again, it's simple terms. I'm not trying to be too complicated here. I'll give you an example here. The preacher may say, repent and trust Jesus because he's the only way. And that's true. That's all he says. But then the teacher comes along. You know, he may give some explanation, by the way, too. The teacher comes along and says, sin is missing the mark. It's not measuring up to God's perfection. Breaking God's law, it's offending his holy and just character, and we are all guilty of it. Jesus died in our place on the cross for our sins, and when we trust in him alone for salvation, we receive the forgiveness of Christ and the righteousness of Christ. 
God has provided only one way of salvation, and that is through Jesus. Unquote. So it's kind of a simplistic illustration, but I hope that you kind of see it and understand a little bit uh, how, how that is. Me, I am more of a teacher than a preacher. I'm sure you guessed that by now. I'm sure you figured that out by now. Uh, there are times I will proclaim God's word without compromise, and it needs to be done. And I will challenge you, and I'll challenge myself. I hope to proclaim the truth, but my desire and my gifting, again, I hope, is to explain the truth of God's word so that you can live it out in your life. That's teaching. And here we have these early followers of Jesus, the Messiah, in this text, devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching or doctrine. Same thing. These get the, the, the word dedicated, completely dedicated, fixed, continuing with intense effort in their study, despite the problems and the opposition. They were serious about learning what the apostles' teaching and doctrine was. In other words, they were not half-hearted followers of Jesus. They were there. They were ready. When the apostles were teaching, when the apostles were preaching, when they were proclaiming something, they were listening. They were taking notes, as many of you are. They were trying to piece these things together. Remember, there was a lot of things taking place at this time. Messiah had been promised, now he's come. What does that all mean? What, what's going on here? What is taking place? Messiah's come, he's been crucified, he's been resurrected. I trust in him. Now what? But people still ask that same question, by the way. And these guys were listening to what the apostles taught. Now, what did the apostles teach? Well, they taught what Jesus told them to teach. You look at the Gospels. That's what they would have proclaimed to them, explaining why Messiah came, his death, his burial, his resurrection, salvation, faith, what the kingdom really was. They explained the Old Testament and how it pointed to Jesus, just as he did on the road. They also gave new revelation by the Holy Spirit which we have written down in the New Testament. Completed. There's no new revelation. Have you considered this? That when we study Scripture, when we study the Bible, the Word of God, we are studying the book, the only book that God Himself orchestrated and led men to write down. This is why the Word of God is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, I was talking about His verbal Word, but we have it written down, which is also powerful. Just think about that for a moment. God's book. Not only that, in our own language. That's a blessing. That is a blessing. And when it comes to this, this is why I teach the Bible. This is why we study the Bible here at Grace Life. This is the spiritual food that we need, you and I, to survive and thrive and to live in our healthy relationship with the Lord. And within the context of this early assembly, they were focused on the teaching within what we would call a service like this. So the, the apostles were explaining to them what the scriptures said, what Jesus meant, what, who he was, why he came, his return, and so much more to them. And I tell you, when something is new, you want to learn more. And when you've been in a religiously oppressed society, like many of them were with the Pharisees and Sadducees, and light comes into the darkness, you want to know more. Think of Russia or China years ago, where Christianity was, and in many ways still is, and continues to be, a hated religion. Atheism ruled, secularism ruled. The door opened for the gospel, the iron curtain fell, and missionaries just flooded in there because people were so hungry to hear the hope that is only available in Christ by his word. Some of the people had never even seen a Bible. Then they got one and they're like, this is amazing. Completely contradictory to what they've been told. And when you live in that kind of environment, and again, 
the word of God, the truth of God, the light of God breaks through, the only thing you can say is tell me more. Tell me more. Share more. Give me more. I want to know more. Help me to understand this. And that is what these early followers of Christ were doing. One example is in Acts 20, 7 through 12. Paul, it says, waxed eloquent until midnight or something like that. Midnight. Now, don't worry, I won't do that, by the way. I, mean, I could if you want me to. I mean, it's fine with me, but to make it a little, you know, uneasy sitting there for seven hours or eight hours or ten hours. And that's when Eutychus fell out of the window, remember? He was taken up and Paul says, no, his life is still in him. He's okay. Because his eyes were heavy with sleep, remember? <laughs> But that's one example where there was explanation going on. So if you wonder why we study the Bible here in our morning services, in our uh, Wednesday night services when they start back up again, or in the Sunday school, this is why. Because it is the pattern that has been set in the New Testament itself. And this is why we will usually go verse by verse over a text. Yes, we have done some topical messages like we're doing now. But we need to read and study the Bible. And again, I have to ask us this question. Do you want to study Scripture? Do you know how to study Scripture on your own to feed yourself? That's why we have Sunday school. You know, do you bring a copy of the Bible or your phone, whichever you, case you may choose? I encourage you to do so. Write in your Bibles. I can't remember who said it, but the uh, an individual said, it may, may have been I don't know if it was Spurgeon or maybe D.L. Moody it says the person who owns a Bible that's falling apart is not falling apart. Something like something to that effect. That's a paraphrase. And it's true. Because when you go through difficulties, guess what's going to give you strength? The Word of God. By the Spirit of God. Do you need a Bible, by the way? If you do, talk to me afterwards. Or if you know somebody that needs one, Hey, let's get him one. This early assembly listened. They were committed to the apostles' doctrine. We listen, and we are committed to it by studying and obeying God's word. So that's preaching, teaching, number three. <clears throat> Verse 43, evangelism. Evangelism. Now at this time in history, there were still apostles and prophets, which there are none today. And they did miracles. Now, why did they do miracles? Here's why. To verify that their message was from God. Because the Jews seek after a sign. That was their culture. And when God was doing something new in Israel's history, he always had someone doing the miraculous. Moses. The prophets. Then Jesus and the apostles. Very specific times in history. It didn't always happen. Very specific times in history. And again, there are no more apostles today. Although God can still do miracles, and he does. And these miracles were highlighted in verse 43. But what we need to recognize is there's a whole bunch of stuff before this. And that the message was the focus that came before these verses. And they were declaring and sharing Jesus with other people. They were evangelizing. They did it within their context then, and today we still do it within our own context. We share Jesus. We proclaim him. So aside from the teaching and preaching, the work of the church, the work of those of us here at Grace Life, because again, we are the church. This building is not the church. We are to declare and to share Jesus. And all we do whether we set up a table at an event in Sanford, hand out water and Bibles and pray for people, or give food to the elementary school to help families, or even as individuals in our own life, we proclaim Him. We proclaim Jesus and the salvation that is only available through Him. Evangelism. This is key. There are many ways to share Jesus. There's a lot of ministries that do this, a lot of stuff you can find online. And, and I mentioned this before, I just want to encourage you again. One simple way to do it 
is to give out a gospel tract. We have a variety of these. Here's uh, steps to peace with God, the steps to heaven, the evidence of God, who is Jesus, or quien es Jesus. We have some Spanish ones too. Again, when I mentioned a few weeks ago, life's ultimate questions. Kids. Hey, kids, I'm Albert Brainstein. You know, kids, kids tracks. In search of truth. We have all these kinds of tracks that are available for you to take and to give to people. And this is something I'm challenging myself to do more of, too, by the way. This is something I need to do more of. So we have a variety of tracks. Take them, share them, give them out to family, to friends. Hey, I've got something as a gift for you. I've got something free. <laughs> Who doesn't want something free, right? Now, some won't accept them. Some will take them, and then they'll throw them away. But some people will read them. And some people do get saved. Some people recognize this is truth. Because more and more in our culture, in our society, people don't hear God's word. They don't know about salvation. They don't know about Jesus. They don't know that they're a sinner. So are we sharing Christ? If not, why not? And I challenge us to share the gospel with one person this week, by the way. And next week, let that be your praise. Whatever happens. You know, I shared the gospel with so-and-so. It could be online. It could be a track. It could be a phone call. It could be an email. It could be a letter. It could be in person. It could be at the coffee shop. It could be at the store. Family member, friend, whoever, wherever. So what do you think happens when you die? You ever thought about the claims of Christ? Who do you think Jesus is? Simple questions can open the door. Simple questions. So we are here to evangelize. Now we'll talk more about this in a few weeks, but I just wanted to say that is one thing that we are here for, to share Jesus. Next, we see in verses 44 through 45. Providing for needs. Providing for needs. The fourth work or activity of the church is providing for the needs of others. These include physical, emotional, spiritual, mental needs that we all have. Because we all have them. And how many times have we asked for prayer for somebody or something like that? In the text, they had all things in common, as it says, sharing with those who are in need. And I need to quickly say and make sure that everyone understands, this has nothing to do with communism or socialism, which are unbiblical and destructive to every society. They were expecting Jesus to return very, very, very soon to start the kingdom age. And they, were, they wanted to be there. They were ready for it. They wanted him to physically rule the world. And they were anticipating this kingdom age. But here's the thing. They voluntarily helped each other. They were not coerced. They were not forced. The government did not make them do it. And if you read Acts 5, Peter says, hey, the land that you own, Ananias and Sapphira, that was yours. To do it as you please, with private property, as you chose. But you lied, and of course now you're going to die. <laughs> and they did. And here's something that most people don't think about. Later, Paul had to take up a collection to take back to Jerusalem to the church there, the assembly there, because of a family. You can only share things amongst ourselves so much before you have a need that you need to fulfill outside of yourself. So that's what occurred. But here's the principle. They provided for each other. And we should do the same. We are a family, and we should be a family and a community that cares for each other. This means we open up to our needs, to our struggles, to prayer requests, to be honest. And then if someone can help provide for that need, then we should do so. Then we should do so. And it may not be anything financial, maybe something completely different. <clears throat> Counsel, wisdom, answering a question. Need financial advice? Talk to Kevin. <laughs> I know somebody. He knows somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we all need help sometimes. And you know what? It's okay to ask for help. It is not a sign of weakness. It is a sign of strength to say, you know what? I can't do this on my own. I need some assistance here. 
whatever the case is. I need, you know, maybe it's prayer, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. And that's what the body of Christ is for. We rejoice with those who rejoice and we weep with those who weep. That's what a, a healthy family should be. And you know what? The Apostle John actually challenges us to do this. And uh, I've got the text up here. 1 John 3, 16 through 18. Now we all know John 3, 16. But here's 1 John 3, 16 through verse 18. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay our own lives, lay down our own lives for the brothers. But if anyone has his world's goods and sees his brother in need yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? That is, if you know your brother or sister is in need of something that you can help with, you say, no, I'm not going to do it. That's not an expression of love. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, lip service, but in deed and in truth. Yes, we tell people we love them, that's fine, we should. But let's also express that in our actions. By providing, that's what John's talking about here. Now, there are times when we cannot help someone. I understand that. We, we somebody get. Somebody comes to you with a need, you know, hey, I need you know, hundred dollars for this. You know, it's very important. You know, there's a medical procedure. I got to get this done. I'm sorry, but I can't. I don't have the money. I'll pray for you. I'll pray that God will provide for you. I'll, I'll you know, I'll, I'll be with you as much as I can, but I can't give you the money. I don't have it. We can't give what we don't have. So don't feel guilty if you don't have the resources to give at that point in time, if you can't do it. Yes, it hurts our hearts and it may be discouraging to the other person, but we can't do everything. We can't do everything. But if we are able to help, we should help. We do it out of love, by the way, not out of guilt, not out of manipulation. Not out of a pity party or a sob story. Oh, okay, this person's coming to me for the 17th time for the same thing. Okay, there's a problem here. Let's sit down and talk. Come here. Come on, let's sit. Let's chit chat. What's really going on here? That's love, by the way. Not enabling. But out of love, we should do what we can to be there for each other, to listen to each other, to love one another, and to provide for one another. But there's also another aspect to this. That is providing for those in need outside of the body of Christ. This is part of evangelism. That is providing physical needs. And providing for those physical needs is a bridge to share the gospel. Providing for physical needs is never an end unto itself. This is what occurred with the uh, liberal denominations many years ago. Well, we'll just love people by our actions and won't say anything. Yeah, that didn't work out very well. I, I met a guy one time that said that, and he disappeared from the church. It's very common. It's very common. But this providing for physical needs is very helpful. And though liberal theologians have perverted this, we are still to do it. We're still to help people where we can and when we can. As best as we can. Let us provide for the needs both within these walls here, within the body here, and those outside of the walls to show God's love and to share the gospel of Christ. Now again, we're going to talk more about evangelism and providing in a future message I'm calling the outreach of the church. The outreach of the church. That'll be in a few weeks. But last we come to verses 46 and 47. Worship. Worship. This is the last work of the church I'm going to highlight. Now, fellowship is included here. But what do they all do? They all praised God. But again, we have to define what is worship. What is it? Well, we just saw the video a few moments ago. There's many wonderful definitions. There's Romans 12, 1 and 2, and, and we'll look at that here in just a second. But other definitions of worship are to bow down. That's literally what worship means, is to bow. To give a sacrifice and more. 
But here's how I'm simply defining it. Giving all of who we are to God. Giving all of who we are to God. That's how I'm defining worship. And, and real quickly, just go ahead and turn over to Romans 12. If you have your Bibles or click in your uh, phones there. And if you heard the, the, the verses a few moments ago, I do want to read them again. Give you just a moment to get there. Romans 12, 1 and 2. So after 11 chapters of doctrine, Paul says, I appeal therefore to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, that is everything I've talked about before this. What is the result of that? To present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship or reasonable act of service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. So worship is a response to understanding what God has done for us in Christ. If you do not understand sin and salvation and who Jesus is and what salvation really entails, you cannot worship God fully because you don't understand what it means. But if you grasp some of what it is to be in Christ, to Him be in you, for Him to love you, for you to love Him, to know what it means to be forgiven of your sin, there is only one response. Thank you, Lord. I want to worship you, I want to praise you, and I want to live for you, and I want to listen to what your word says, and I want to follow you faithfully. And all of that is worship. <clears throat> giving our thoughts, giving our money, which is really his money, giving our body, which is really his, his belongs to him, the desires, goals, direction, education, relationships, and more to him. Lord, here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you are my God. And in response to who you are, in response to what you've done, I come to you, your child, to worship you and to thank you for so many things. And by the way, this is a choice we make. This is a choice that we make, regardless of what's going on in our lives. It includes praising God. It also includes giving. It includes listening to the Word of God being taught and preached. It, this is part of the work of the church. It's also living for him and doing everything for his glory. What does that mean? Let me give you a few verses here, which you have down there in your uh, outlines. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. You know, usually think, well, I can glorify God if I go out and share the gospel and 17,000 people get saved. Well, that'd be great, by the way. Not dismissing that. You know, or I, I, I can you know, worship God by you know, going to church and sing it to Him. That's great. Do it. But eating and drinking? What? The most mundane things in life. Doing laundry? Changing a diaper? Cooking? Cleaning? Putting gas in the car? Yes, we can do it all for him. Why? Well, who gave you that car? Well, I worked hard for it. Who gave you the strength to do it? God. Who gave you that house? Well, I worked hard for it. Who gave you the strength to work hard to get that house, to make the money? Whose house is it, by the way, really? God, yours. It's his. Well, you know, I, I, you know this, this, this wonderful salad here that's got some wonderful food in it. Oh, I'm so grateful for it. Well, who grew those things? God did. And those individuals who gather all that stuff up, you know, whether you purchased, or whether you got it yourself or grew it yourself, were you in control of the growing of the fruit and the vegetables? No, God is. That's why we thank him when we eat our food. So whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, and I love this, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now I'm still learning how to do this, by the way. I haven't arrived yet. 
<laughs> so I'm still there with you. Here's another one, Colossians 3.17. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father through him. One more. Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Whatever you do, you see a pattern here? Whatever you do, work heartily. Here's the, the, the work aspect of it. For those of us who have jobs, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Yes, you've got a boss. Yes, you've got a manager. You've got co-workers and things like that. I understand that. He's not dismissing that, of course. But ultimately, if you're a Christian and you have a job, you work for the Lord. And that will set your work ethic apart from those who do not serve the Lord. You'll be honest, sincere, you'll work hard, you won't waste time, you won't steal from the company, you won't uh, do this when your boss is not around. Boss is coming, oh! Happens. It happens all the time. And I guess we all have breaks and things like that. I don't need to get up and stretch. I understand that. But when we recognize that we're working for the Lord, working for the glory of God, that changes our work ethic. So worship. Now, yes, we sing. We come here, we hear, hear the word of God preached and taught, which is also part of worship, again, is giving as well. But here's the thing. Here's where I want to start finishing up. As we go out of here, and yes, I'm using the phrase as we go, we continue worshiping the Lord. Worship is not a one-day thing. I'm going to go to church to worship. No. No. Worship is a way of life. Well, how do we do this when we go out of here? Well, we love him. We sing to him, yeah. We think about what he's done for us in Christ. Have you ever thought about what it really means to be forgiven? What it means to have the mind of Christ? To have a relationship with God? For him to know you and love you and you can love him? He knows me and he still loves me in spite of me. We'd be a good worker on our job. We, we're an ethical leader or manager. We treat our employees well. We treat our neighbors well, our family, our friends, and other Christians with respect and dignity and honor and love. We also tell the truth. And as the text said, we're also thankful. Thankful. Being thankful for the meal that we eat. Being thankful for the health that we have. Thankful for the car that we drive. I just got a, a message from a friend of mine over in Pakistan. His daughter has pneumonia. And they don't have the facilities like we have here. It's not easy for him to just, oh, okay, I'm going to go to the hospital and get some medicine. It doesn't work that way for other places. Please pray for her, by the way. Pray for him, too. They've got a few kids. Being thankful for what you have, the ability to breathe, the ability to think. I remember years ago, my grandmother, she died of Alzheimer's. Horrible disease. Horrible disease. And uh, I remember mom and dad, they took care of her for the last two years of her life. They said they want to put her in a home. But before she got really bad, I remember uh, visiting and, and dad said, do you, do you remember Michael? I said, no. Be thankful you can even think. See and hear. Don't take those little things for granted. Because they can be taken away very quickly. Be thankful for the people in your life, the family and the friends that you have. Be thankful for what God's given to you, not just physically, but spiritually too. 
maybe he's helped you in ways that you remember, you can think back and think, wow, he really did provide in a wonderful way that time. Or maybe you had something very, very wrong and he healed you. Be thankful. Or maybe he's just giving you strength day by day to live. Be thankful. Because worship also includes humility. Because we come to him as humble individuals, needy individuals, and say, Lord, I need you. But unless we know that we're needy, we won't come to him. We won't worship him. And that is a heart problem. That's a heart issue. So doing something for God's glory, do it with all your heart out of love and truth for him, as well as evangelism. And do it in faith. So today we looked at a few different things here. Sorry. Five things we've actually looked at. Preaching, teaching, evangelism, providing for needs and worship. Now much more can be said about all of these. This is just a summary. But these things with others are why we are here on earth, but this is also why we are here at Grace Life. This is, is this what we are about? I hope so. Are we doing these five things based upon God's grace, based upon his word, based upon love? These are what we need to be doing. This is who we need to be as the body. And this is what I exhort us to become as we continue to be faithful to him. And one of the things I talked about was evangelism. Well, how do I share the faith? How do I share my faith? How do I share the gospel? Well, here's a few simple things. First of all, and this is for everyone here and those watching and listening too. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you given your life to him? He gave his life for you. We're all sinners. We've all come short of God's glory. We've all broken his law. We're, we spit in his face as it were, trying to do things our own way. We've offended a holy, holy, holy God. And we all deserve hell. But in his love and in his holiness, he provided one way. He sent his son, who took upon human flesh, born of the virgin, lived the perfect life, said he was God in human flesh, died a sacrificial, atoning death on the cross for our sins. Arose physically three days later, and he will return one day in power and glory to judge the living and the dead. And his word says that you can only have forgiveness of sin and salvation and a relationship with God, a right relationship with God, by faith in God, Jesus alone, who is God himself. All by his grace. Not by works. Have you done that? Simple way to explain it. So if you don't know Christ, again, if you're here, if you're watching, I'm talking to you. Put your faith in him alone. Give your life to him. Christians, are we helping others? Are we there for others as best as we can? I know we're all limited. I understand that, believe me. But are we, there for, are we there for each other? Do we know of a need within the body here that we need to adjust and address? If you have a need, let us know. So at least we can pray for you. And are we truly worshiping Him? Not just here, but outside of this gathering. You say, well, how do I know? Well, You've probably heard this before, but it's still true. If you want to know what you worship, what do you do with your money and your time? Where does your money go? Where does your time go? Now, I understand there are exceptions. You know, when you've got a 20-month-old, you know, all of our money and all of our time goes to him. <laughs> but we don't worship him. He probably thinks we do, but we don't. <laughs> so I understand things like that, but this is a general challenge. What do you do with your time and with your money? Guess what? It's God's time and it's God's money. 
That's a challenge I have for myself too. And yes, we take vacations and we relax, we do things that we enjoy, I understand that too. But that's kind of a good indication. And of course, are we sharing Christ? Are we sharing Christ? And we will not grow as individuals and as a church if we are not sharing Jesus with other people. Or at least inviting them to come. Inviting them to come. And that's an encouragement I have for all of us. But also, too, just want to remind us one thing before we finish. Whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, do it for his glory. Our Father and God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that there are so many things that you've challenged us to do. We've only talked about five today. Well, these five are, <laughs> these five are, are something that uh, can take a while to, to get into. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us as a body, as a church, to follow through with these things. However you lead us, May we be faithful to you. May we be faithful to your word. And may we have an ear attentive to you and to others. Lord, you know the needs that are here. And I do pray, Father, for those who are in need. Again, my, my friend and his daughter. Uh, for the, the baby. Lord, we pray for healing for that child. For those over in China. Lord, we pray for protection. We pray for healing and for a solution to this virus. Protection for other parts of the world, including America, too. So we lift up all of these needs to you. Pray for those who could not make it today. Pray everything is okay. And pray, Lord, for your work in our lives. So Lord, help us to worship you in spirit and truth and to understand what it means to glorify you in all we say and all we do, and that you would be pleased, that you would be honored. And may we also share Christ. Give us opportunities, Lord, and help us to step forward to make some opportunities as well. So we commit our time to you, we praise you, and we look forward to what you will do. And all this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And once again, you have those connection cards in front. Um, not just another minute or so to fill those out.